Have the intention of staying long in France, Mr. Barrett? I don't know. That is to say, I didn't know there was any restriction apart from the question of money. Oh, please. I asked you only because I thought you might have forgotten that your passport expires next month. No, I hadn't forgotten. Thank you. You have nothing to declare? Nothing. Nothing whatever. Nothing to declare. You can't declare an emptiness in the heart. What would you think of me, I wonder, if I'd said only a few personal belongings and a blank life? A madman at the worst, a self-pitying eccentric at the best. How oh, I dread the holidays. Although I've spent them always in the France I love so well. A teacher of the French language. Who has no idea of what he's looking for. I'm afraid there's some mistake. How was Paris? Eleven. All right, as you wish. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it will be opened unto you. It seems to me I have knocked and the door has remained shut. God seems to want me no more than man. And yet, I don't quite believe that. I don't behave differently, nor apparently do I look so very different from other men. If I did, why should that man in the market square mistake me for someone else? A lonely man dramatizes life for himself. I must learn not to do that. Nothing in the past to be particularly ashamed of. Nothing in the future. Perhaps a man has to be empty before
for he can be used. Used for what? God knows. One moment, sir. Madam. Thank you. Wait. Give that to the gentleman, please. Yes, madam. The lady asked me to give you this, sir. Being nobody to introduce us, one of us must break the silence. There are two of us, undoubtedly, look. Gentlemen. In view of this coincidence, may a stranger offer you a drink? A comparative stranger, I suppose we should say. Oh, charming. Don't you think? Most interesting. Well, what will you drink, brother? Cognac? Two cognacs. A twin cognacs. Do you think we shall grow up to look like them? It seems simpler to let ourselves be taken for twins than try to explain what we ourselves do not understand. Do not understand, indeed. You couldn't perhaps be the devil? No. I didn't think you could be. I thought I'd better make sure. Could you, perhaps? I'm afraid not. No, it's nothing as simple as that. But they're compliments of the little ones. Uh, no, uh, cognac. Don't you think? Oh, oh I, I think so, yes. I never drank much at home, but um, this is rather an occasion, isn't it? It is rather. Heaven knows what are the odds against such an encounter. Enormous. Large. Astronomical. <laughs> Worth the trouble. To astronomy. To astronomy. <laughs> you know, I haven't laughed so much for years. Not since uh, I can't remember when. In fact, looking back, it almost seems that I never laughed at home. Oh, 
Or not really. There's very little to laugh about in the common room at a provincial university. I didn't mean it was that which was odd. What then? Well, twice, uh, talking about things at home, you've spoken in the past tense. You just said, I never laughed, not I never laugh. And before that, I never drank, not I never drink. Did I? I wasn't conscious of it. I suppose it's because I feel about it in the past tense. Aren't you planning to go back then? I don't know. I'm not planning not to. I'm just not planning. It would make no difference, really, if I didn't. For a term or so in the common room, in the middle of that dreary red brick arguing, someone might say, I wonder what's become of Barrett. And soon it would be, I wonder what became of Barrett. My landlady would look after my cat. She's largely alienated its affections already. Traitorous animals, cats. You're not married. No, the situation never arose. I thought once it might, but it didn't. Relatives? Some second cousins in Westmoreland. I suppose you really are there. Oh, yes. Prove it. Steady. Oh, fair enough. You're there, all right. Too much so. How? Oh, that's not at all interesting. Oh, I'm sure it is. Uh, come, I've done all the talking about myself. You'll make me feel I've imposed. Uh, well, how shall I put it? Just as you have, uh, as you've been telling me, too little life, I have too much. It's hard for me to believe how that could be. If you tried it, you would know. I have a chateau dating from the 16th century, badly in need of repair and modern plumbing. I have a title of the same antiquity, equally lacking in modern conveniences. I have an income dating from the 19th century, when the franc was 25 to the pound. I have a family business which runs at a loss, but which cannot be closed, because that would throw faithful employees out of work. Those are all things. Life consists of people. People. Very well. I have... No, no, I can't bear it. Let us just say that there are too many. And more than enough. Too much or too little. There seems nothing in life between. Still, I... I don't know that I wouldn't prefer your surfeit to my own lack. I wonder if you would. Here a moment, and I'll see if they have a room. My key. No call in the morning. I may sleep very late. Mm. Uh, will you bring me up a bottle of champagne? Open it, please. They haven't a room free, but mine has two beds, so if you wouldn't mind sharing. I don't like to intrude. Ah, oh, it's no intrusion. Much simpler than trudging elsewhere. Ah, it's trying to rain. I thought so. So. Exactly a palace, but men have fared worse. I'm rather drunk on such a noteworthy occasion. That should 
cause neither surprise nor regret. Not regretting it in the least, I assure you. First time in years. That sort of thing's frowned on in our common room. Not like uh, some universities, college port and drunken dons. Plain living and high thinking for us. Oh, thank you. Good night. I took the liberty of ordering us a nightcap. There's no liberty, whatever. No, oh, silly fellow's only brought one glass. Oh, well, not worth disturbing him again. I'll use a glass from the bathroom. Champagne, all right. On top of all that brandy. The very thing. It's always as well to finish up with something lighter. Tell me tomorrow, if I have misled you. To tomorrow. To tomorrow. I can't remember when I last cared whether or not I saw tomorrow. Excellent champagne. I don't suppose I ever shall now. Yeah. Come now, Mr. Barrett. I'm sure that in the morning things will look quite different. Come in. Ah, you're awake, sir. What is this game? No, sir. I was getting rather worried at your sleeping so late, but they told me downstairs you'd given instructions not to call you. I had given instructions? Yes, sir. I didn't quite know what to do because of the ladies being worried, so I took the liberty of telephoning Saint-Gilles and saying that you were detained on urgent business. I hope I did right, sir. You didn't do right at all. I'm sorry, sir. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> no. And how could you? Oh, thank you. It's not mine, but seeing he's taken my things. Shall I run your bath, sir? Listen, we better begin at the beginning. My name is Barrett, B-A-R-R-A-T-T, and I teach the French language at an English university. I met your employer last night, purely by chance, and it so happens that we are alike as if we were twins. Yes, sir. Quite, sir. Look, I'll, I'll show you. See? Yes, it's a remarkable likeness, sir. You have a headache, sir. I'll get you your cure. This is clearly a matter for the police. Look, while I'm having my bath, you telephone the police and tell them to send an officer, a responsible officer, here at once. You understand? Yes, sir. I understand. No, Doctor, he seems in perfectly good health, apart from the delusion. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'll do my best. Very good, Doctor. Until later, then.
Well? There seems to have been some mistake, sir. Oh, there does, does there? Yes, sir. Just as I was going to pick up the telephone to speak to the police, it rang. And I had the shock of my life, sir. It was my master, speaking from saint Gine, asking to speak to you. I explained you were taking a bath, sir. And he said not to trouble you to come to the telephone, but to ask you to drive to saint Gilles with me, sir, and he would explain everything. Well, that seems a very cavalier way of dealing with the situation. I suppose it's the only way to get things cleared up. stand by. As soon as I have received a satisfactory explanation from your employer, I shall want to return to Le Mans at once. Very good, sir. Unless, that is to say, he has my car here, perhaps you'd better look in the garage. A Morris Minor XMY 866. Uh, with a GB plate, naturally. Yes, sir. Naturally, sir. In which case, I shan't need your car. I want to talk about that. I don't want to talk about anything. I want to see this man who has played this ridiculous joke on me, hear his explanation, if he has one, receive an apology, reclaim my luggage, and go. Yes, quite, quite. But may we have a word first? In here, I think we shall not be interrupted. The ladies are in the drawing room. There now. Let's have a look at you. Um, sit down, please, and... Cross one leg over the other. What is this farce? If you'll just sit down. I have no intention of sitting. I've come here to see the owner of all this and see him I will. All in good time. Not all in good time at once. Very well, if you insist, come with me. There. There he is. This is a madhouse. Oh, no, no, it's not as bad as that. Shall we sit down and talk calmly? Calmly? I will listen to an explanation, but you cannot expect me to be calm. Oh, please do your best. These hysterical outbursts do nothing to alleviate the schizophrenic delusion. Oh, do go on. Well, now, you will understand that when she received the telegram, your wife was very disturbed. Telegram? What telegram? The telegram that your wife received this morning from the doctor you visited in Paris, explaining that you were subject to periodic fits of delusion that you were somebody else. I am somebody else. That was before you were located. Fortunately, by the time Gaston telephoned to say that he had found you, I was on the spot. How very fortunate. Quite. I therefore instructed Gaston to humour you in the belief that you were the person you thought you were and to bring you here to meet the person you thought you were not. And by means of this simple confrontation... But you have confronted me with nobody. Exactly. Thus making it clear that there is no one to confront you with except yourself. And leading to a reintegration of the two supposed personalities... It merely needs your cooperation. My cooperation, I like that. I am to cooperate with you in pretending that I'm somebody else. Or, or rather, that I am somebody else who thinks he's me, is that it? Broadly, in non-medical terms, yes. Well, broadly, in non-medical terms, I tell you my name is John Barrett. Oh, you're back. You're back. You look better than one might expect after two weeks' debauchery in Paris. Did you enjoy it? I never enjoy Paris very much, really. Of course not. You went on business to try and save the foundry. Business can be very tiring. You've had your hair cut differently. Have I? Yes, it's nowhere near so distinguished looking. In fact, a bit common, if anything. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I don't mind, really. It's lovely you're back. We were beginning to think we should never see you again. 
Heavens, that reminds me. Granny wants to see you. She's in a beastly temper. So am I. Where is she? In her room, of course. Come with me. Why? Are you frightened? I do believe you're frightened. Well, I am rather, yes. I'll come to the top of the stairs with you. Come on. I'm not coming any further. She says she's sick of the sight of me. I know she doesn't mean it, really. But I'll keep out of her way. Is that you at last? It is I. My wicked boy. My pussy cat. Am I not even worth a kiss? Never before have I been so fussed over, unless it was in the cradle. Somehow I knew you. Never before so welcome. Welcome in what appears to be a madhouse. Let her talk. Maybe there will be a clue in what she says. The life you have doubtless been leading, you might look worse. Tell me about Paris. Tell me every detail. No, don't. I don't want to hear. I won't forgive you for staying away so long. There's something I must explain. Later, later. Lie to me later. Entertain me now. This house is so boring when you are away. Francois weeping, Blanche praying, and the child mooning around like an unwanted mouse. I am not who you think I am. <laughs> I know. I know. You've had a nervous breakdown. Oh, I was worried at first when the telegram arrived. But then I thought to myself, I know my boy, I know my pussycat. It is a delicious invention, a clever excuse for neglecting people and forgetting things. Though I hope you did not use it as an excuse to forget my present. You didn't forget my present. I don't know if he did or not. Don't play cat and mouse with me when you know how much I need it. How much I need it now. Don't torment me. I've been waiting all day long for you to come back. And now I can't wait any longer. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? <laughs> no, from outside. I haven't been listening. I was just waiting outside. Your mistress is ill. You'd better go downstairs and fetch the doctor. It's not the doctor can give her what she needs. You have brought it for her, haven't you? I don't know. First off, I'm packing your things. I just went along to look. All in order, sir. I put the parcels on the desk. Is this it? This. To mother with love, morphine. What an attentive son. Well, that's one bit of the jigsaw in place. this silly charade you're playing. Madam, I fully understand you're going to have difficulty in accepting what I say is true, but I beg you to do so. I am not your husband. <laughs> oh, aren't you? Then why are you wearing his clothes? 
That is a long and complicated story. Then don't tell it. I hate long stories. Especially lies. This is not my suit, not my tie. These are not my cufflinks. Well, then why are you wearing them? Why are you speaking with his voice? Why are you looking at me with his eyes? Do you think I don't recognize those cruel eyes? No, tell me about Paris. Tell me a lie about Paris. How is the Eiffel Tower? <laughs> I bet even you couldn't think of a lie about the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> Would you bet? Would you? <laughs> oh, my dear, you must be calm. Calm when he teases me like this. Except that it's not teasing. Teasing's what children do in innocence. I assure you, Francoise, and I speak professionally, that Jack is not teasing you. He quite genuinely believes that he is somebody else. I suggest you keep out of this. You only make things worse. Indeed, I do not. Indeed, you do. The truth is quite simple, as the truth normally is, so let's stick to it. It's as simple as this. I am not Jack, whatever the name may be. I merely look like him. Why don't you tell us straight out what game you're up to? Selfish end you're after. We'll agree to give it to you right away. You, you get it in the end anyhow, and then we, we can stop playing this silly farce. I'm not up to any game. This is the truth. Truth? It's a word that has no meaning when you use it. When you speak, every sane, decent word becomes a monster. Until I, I feel like a child in a nightmare. I'm the one who's in a nightmare. You gone. What did I do to deserve it? Francoise, you mustn't torture yourself. Sir. You must go and rest. Jack and I will discuss this problem. at once. Will you come up and talk to me? Or shall I come down and talk to you? I'll come up in a minute. You'd better hurry. I'll count up to 50, and if you're not here by then, I really will come down. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Eight, twenty-nine, forty, forty-one, forty-two, forty-eight, forty-nine, fifty. Oh, you're just in time. Don't sit down. You're out of breath. It's very wrong of you to frighten people like that. Oh, I don't frighten people. Just you. Do it again. I shan't take any notice. Then you'll have to jump and serve you right. And serve you right too make an awful mess and you'd have to clear it up. Bloodthirsty little brute. I'm talking of bloodthirstiness. What's that? Oh, oh, it's the martyrdom of Saint Sebastian. I got bored with one Aunt Blanche gave me. So I thought I'd do something more modern. Mm, who are these? Oh, they're the secret police. What secret police? Oh, just secret police. And that's for you, and I pray for you. What you pray for for me? Oh, I pray that whatever good you have done, whatever evil you have suffered, gain for you the remission of your sins, an increase of grace, and the reward of eternal life. Thank you. Any particular sins? No, I don't think any particular ones. Did you have a good trip? So you won't have to go away again, I mean. It's difficult to say. If you do, I probably really will jump out of the window. Well, do you think you could go to sleep now? I should think so. I've had insomnia rather badly while you've been away. That's it for be better now you're back. Oh, well, good night. Good night. Will I turn out the light? No, I think I'll read for a bit.
Enough's enough. It's not an adventure anymore. It's taking the shape of a nightmare. His nightmare, not mine. I call it quits. Man or devil, I made no bargain with him. I'm free to go. I beg your pardon, sir. Much better if you undress and get into bed, sir. I shall sleep as I am. I'm tired. Even so. It's worth making the effort. Are you married? Have you a family? No longer, sir. Not since the Germans were here. Let's see. So? Perhaps I'm lucky. When people have wives and children, they have responsibilities. Responsibility to whom? To this unhappy household? Is it my responsibility because fate has made me look identical with another man? Am I my brother's keeper? We met by chance. Chance. And good night, sir. Good night, Gaston. Very gratifying to find you so completely yourself again. Completely myself, thank you. Yes. Well, then, during your absence, I've done my best to look after the problems here, but it has been a responsibility. It's because it's such a responsibility that I've decided to assume it. Come in. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Gaston. Uh, on the table, please. If we may discuss the various problems in turn... If we may discuss the various problems later. Uh, forgive me being so unsociable, but I can't bear company at breakfast. Uh, except, of course, uh, female company. And that not always. Thank you, Gaston. <laughs> Stroll. I'll come with you. Funny Maldraw getting in such a state. He's usually quite good with you. When are you going to let me read that book? Which one? The one you named Maldraw after. When you're a bit older. 
You always say that. Why are you dressed like this? Can't you guess who I am? Joan of Arc. Right. Yes, I thought I'd be Joan of Arc today. St. Therese is too fatiguing to be very often. Besides, on days when I am very conscious of wishing I was a boy, Joan of Arc's more suitable. Why do you wish that today? I don't know. Something to do with you being back, I suppose. I know you'd rather I was one. What makes you say that? Well, Aunt Blanche keeps telling me. Then Aunt Blanche keeps telling you nonsense. I wish I could help. I much prefer you as you are. How do you expect that child to grow up and do anything except a savage when you don't teach her even elementary good manners, like being punctual for meals? I'm sorry. Oh, yes, you're always sorry. Where is she, anyway? Making herself presentable. Well, that'll be an agreeable change. Good morning, Jacques. Good morning. Nice to see you after so long. Good morning. And how was Paris? Oh, um, cold for the time of year. I mean, from the point of view of the contract, did you see Tissot? Uh, no, not Tissot. Naturally, we at the foundry are anxious to know. The work people are anxious to know. I make it a rule never to discuss business at table. Thank you. We are all anxious to know. Sorry I'm late. Your father was late, too. I know, we were out walking together. I happened to see these in your dressing room, so I thought I'd save you the trouble and bring them down. Happened to see? Well, anyhow. I thought I'd save you the trouble. The most kind of you. Will you hand them round or shall I? Oh, please do. Amen, that's me. You'd have thought seeing I have two initials, I'd have had two presents, really. Greedy. Yes, that must be for you, Mother. Thank you, thank you darling. And B, that's for you, I suppose, Aunt Blanche. I'm sorry, Cousin Aristide, there doesn't seem to be anything for you. Oh, I wouldn't expect it. After all, I always get a box of cigars at Christmas. May I? Of course. I'm as curious as you are. Oh, thank you, thank you. It's wonderful. So long as you're pleased. People always say it's just what I wanted, when it really isn't. But it really is. Come on, I want to see what yours is. Whatever is it? What is it? Well, what does it look like? It looks like a toy. Perhaps that's what it is. But you don't give toys to grown-ups. I can't think why not. if you like. Oh, put it down, please. You hadn't forgotten. Oh, how silly of me. I'm sorry. What tune is that? Oh, it's a tune your father and I used to know long ago. Before you were born. Jack, you're mad. You must have had it made specially. Hardly anyone knows that song except us. It's been shockingly expensive. Thank you. How beastly of me when all the time you. So long as you like it. Like it? Still open yours. Don't you think you'd better sit down? Get on with your lunch. Oh, it's only fair. You've seen our present, so you ought to let us see yours. Yes, do sit down and have your lunch. Should I open it for you? If you like. Mmm, smells terribly rich. There's a card with it, too. If you don't like it, you can always sprinkle it on the horse. What horse? Sit down at once. 
It's very rude to read things written to other people. Other people is about right. I wish someone would explain about the horse. It's a joke of your father's. You mustn't ask people to explain jokes, especially when they've gone wrong. While you're away, I've been doing some rather careful thinking about our output figures. I think the best plan will be if I come to the foundry after lunch and we will discuss everything there. To the foundry? Why not? Oh, no reason. Uh, with no disrespect to your administration, I think perhaps I've been a little uh, neglectful. The men, of course, will be delighted. Good, then uh, I'll come this afternoon. But you can't. It's Wednesday. So it is Wednesday. You know the only thing that makes my music less intolerable is you driving me into Villado. Of course. How stupid of me to forget. You seem awfully forgetful since you came back from Paris. We'll come afterwards, about a quarter past four, I should think. She was right. You are getting forgetful. Thank you. Better get it out of the house, I thought. Perhaps. Give the horse a pat from me. Let's play a game. I'm a stranger who's never driven into Villado before, and you have to tell me the way. That's a very stupid game to me. Not as stupid as you might think. Which way to turn here, for instance? Oh, very well, if it amuses you. Right. Well, if I survive my music lesson, we'll meet here as usual. In how long? Are you still playing that game? An hour and ten minutes, of course. Ba, 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 ba. Well, Jacques de Gay, I'm in your shoes. I have assumed your clothes and your responsibilities. And in a curious way, I'm grateful to you. It's everything I've lacked. People to need me, a home, a purpose. But I can't get into your mind. You escaped me. What am I supposed to be here for? To solve your problems for you? Or is it to let you be elsewhere? Let her teach you. I apologize if I appear to be trespassing, but even so. Trespassing? On your own property? Teach you to treat me like you did the other evening, I meant. Oh, I can explain about that. Oh, I am sure you can. You can explain anything. You ought to have been a politician. Two weeks away and never a word. Then a postcard. Notre Dame by floodlight at that. Saying, meet me at our bar in Le Mans. Our bar. Indeed. Here. And when I get there, what happens? The other evening, I wasn't feeling quite myself. Very much yourself, if you ask me. It's when you behave well that I start worrying that there must be something wrong with you. Well, don't stand there looking as if you've never seen a saddle before. Hang it up. So why I should worry, I don't know or why I should be lonely. There are plenty of men who would treat me better than you do. Oh, one of these Wednesday afternoons, you are going to come here and find that I've gone, gone off with a millionaire, or with a lion tamer from a traveling circus. I don't care which, so long as it takes me away. Traveling circus, perhaps. That will be restful after life with you. Well, seeing you're here, you might as well come in, I suppose. Why I stay on here, I just don't know. Stay on here, hidden away for your occasional pleasure in a corner of a small country town when there is Paris and all the world waiting unexplored. But I do know why, don't I? And you know, don't you? 
because I love you. And you pretend to love me. Pretend not very well, but with a great charm. Though not somehow today, let me hear you pretend. Say you love me. I shan't believe it, but I like to hear it. What you want me to say? That I love you as much as I have ever done? That I love you the same as always? Always? There is not such a word. Shouldn't be anyhow. Don't say you love me always. Say you love me now. If you don't like it, you can always sprinkle it on the horse. Oh, yes, of course. It's a present for you. Uh, uh, I wasn't sure if you'd like it, so... Um... But what are you talking about? You know perfectly well it's the only scent I ever consider using. Just a joke. Ah, oh, it's like a joke when it's in your handwriting. But not when you say it somehow. But thank you. And for the proof that you did think of me at least once in Paris. At least once. How often, truly? At least once a day, I should think. Liar. Never mind, it's a pretty lie. Pretty like the flowers, like the scent. And how did you find a mausoleum? The house? What else? You seem to have only half your wits with you today. Well, the other half's preoccupied. With the mausoleum. Is it worse than usual? Well, frankly, I don't know. About the same, probably. It's just that I feel less fitted to deal with the problems. You've got to. It's expected of me, I know. It's time I went to meet the child. Thank you for reminding me. I wish I hadn't. So do I. Meanwhile? Meanwhile? Meanwhile, I'm here. Then? Then until then. Next Wednesday. Before if possible. Well, who knows when that circus will come to town. <laughs> what do you think he was? Nothing in particular. Why? Looked as if it was something in particular. That's all. Just circuses, I suppose. Oh, that was last week, anyhow. Huh. Ah, here we are. Punctual to the minute. Sir, you are welcome. Monsieur Lacoste, our works manager. Oh, how foolish of me. Here I am, making introductions as if you were a stranger. Not that you aren't, almost. I feel like one, almost. It's been a long time, Mr. Jacques. How long, in fact? Oh, 14 years. As long as that. I think you better assume that I know nothing. Explain everything to me, as if to a stranger. Everything is as it was. Our kind of work doesn't change. Oh, even so. Everything, that is to say, except the profits. <laughs> you will take a glass to celebrate. To celebrate what? The new contract. Who said anything about a new contract? You didn't exactly say anything, but your visit after so long. In fact, I took the liberty of intimating to the men... That... The men were very pleased. It's been a worrying time. Well, it still is a worrying time. Doubtless, but if we all pull our weight. <laughs> well, what is it? I was just thinking of Cousin Aristide's weight. It's not very polite. It's of no consequence. Fair comment, even. All this sedentary work. You really won't? Uh, no, thank you. Of course. Thank you, no. I think I will. I feel in need of a little digestive. Blanche's luncheon was excellent, but lavish. Most days, I content myself with a sandwich here at my desk. How many men do we employ here? Uh, how many is it exactly, Lacoste? Forty-two. Plus the twelve pensioners, of course. Well, Maturin died last week, but his widow remains. I must acquaint myself, uh, reacquaint myself, that is, with all the problems involved. If you're going to talk about problems, I'll go and watch the glass flows, if Mr. Lacoste doesn't mind. Does Mr. Lacoste mind? Not in the least. I'll come with you. I must see how the Dijon order's getting on. 
I won't disguise from you the fact that I am faced with a problem. I mean, no doubt about that. All I can say is 150 years is a long time. And we, the men, will do anything we can to help. I'm sure. But outside where the customers are, well, things change in 150 years. Mass production, for instance. One would think there would still be a market for work of quality. One would think so. Hope so. Madam, your mother has been asking for you, sir. Recently? Every ten minutes for the last hour. Every ten minutes for the last hour. Good evening. I almost thought you might be late. <laughs> I don't know what you're smiling about when I've been imprisoned here reading this trash. Trash. Sit down. I open with pawn to king's fourth. Where have you been? I took the child to Villardot for her music lesson. And your own? Was that interesting? Mine. Your lesson in conversational Italian, you idiot. Well, there's nothing I don't know about. People try to hide everything from me, but they're wasting their time. Well, are you going to move or not? What else? Or did you stay learning Italian until now? I went to the foundry. What is that bladder Aristide going to do for a living once we've shut? I hardly talked to him. I talked to um, Lacoste. Decent little man, if I remember. Hard on him. On all of them. But there's no other way. There'll have to be. I've decided we must renew the contract, even on unfavorable terms. You've decided. I've decided. It would be too great a hardship for them if we closed. What about the hardship on us if we don't close? We must manage. Manage? How can we manage? Ugh. I must concentrate on this game, or I shall faint. Queen's knight to bishop's third. What's happened to you while you've been away? Almost as if you were a different person. I am, as I tried very hard to explain. You haven't gone and got mixed up in politics. You can't condemn people to starve. We can starve. You can condemn us to starve. So long as all those socialists at the foundry have enough to eat. Bishop to Rook's fourth. If you wish to indulge this sentimental fad of yours, the solution is in your own hands. Namely? Have a son, of course, you fool. Pawn to Queen's Knight's fourth. Lever. Well, then there's only one other way the settlement can become untight. The common little iron monger of a father of hers had it all tied up so tight. What other way? Clause 14, paragraph 2. <laughs> Yes, come in. Uh -huh. I had thought you might come and see me when you got back. I got caught playing chess. Oh, how is she today? Sulfurous. <laughs> Anything in particular? Everything in general. We got into an argument about keeping the foundry open or not. Oh, that. Tell me. You like these earrings? Very pretty. Hmm? 
did love my musical box. I'm glad. You knew I would, didn't you? Sorry I was beastly last night. It's all right. No, it's not all right. I shall feel beastly till you show you forgive me. Show you forgive me. <laughs> What's that you're hiding? I'm not hiding anything. Oh, why are you reading this? I wanted... There's something I wanted to verify. It verifies if you didn't know. I'll read it to you. No, I don't need to. I know it by heart. I didn't know I had a copy of this, did you? Well, I have. Papa said I ought to have one. Oh, Francois. Here it is. Clause 14, paragraph 2. In the event of the said Francoise Amélie Hilaire dying without male issue, the endowment shall pass in equal shares to her surviving female issue and such issue's legal guardian. Legal guardian, that's you. I always said that clause was like inviting you to murder me. He said it as a joke at the time, but it stopped being a joke now, hasn't it? I don't think it's a joke at all. I thought of a better joke anyhow. I'm going to write to the stonemasons. No, well, I'm still alive and have the chance. And I'm going to have them carve clause 14, paragraph 2 on my tombstone. That'll give people something to talk about. Francoise, my dear, please yes, listen to me. I shan't have a tombstone, shall I? I shall be buried in your family vault among all your proud, horrid family. Will you listen to me? Yes, I'll listen. Good. We'll send for the lawyers and have them draw up a new agreement so that in no circumstances can any of that money come to me, appointing whom you like as the child's guardian. But you can't alter it. It's like a will. We'll see. Whatever can be done, we'll do. Wish me dead. I wish you to be happy. We'll send for the lawyers. Oh, it's not that that matters. It's just trying to believe that what you're saying is true. None of that matters. Nothing would matter if only you loved me. Oh, if only you loved me. I'll never learn to play the piano if I try for a hundred years. Just think, a hundred years, Wednesday afternoons. Sometimes think that's what hell must be really like. Not playing some things. Just going on being bored forever and ever. You're probably right. But I forgot. You don't believe in hell, do you? In that kind of hell, yes. The worm that dies not. Oh, well. See you later. you should have said. There's something I must say to you. In the midst of all the other problems of the mausoleum, it's been going to and fro in my mind all the past week. And in mine. You don't know what I'm going to say. I do. Not all of it, but the essential part I know. I don't know who you are, but I know who you are not. I don't feel I know much more myself. I won't listen unless you promise beforehand it won't make any difference. Promise. Nod your head if you promise. Otherwise, go away without saying anything. It's so impossible that after the first shock, I, I found it easier to accept than if it were merely improbable. I mean, it's so far away from any ordinary human experience that I can accept it like one accepts a dream. A dream? Well, in a dream, all the ordinary behavior of space and time ceases to operate, but nothing surprises you. Ten days ago, I didn't know that this room existed. I didn't know that you existed. But now, it seems perfectly natural to be here. It seems perfectly natural. It's madness to question the rightness of a dream, but... Um... You 
Please forgive me for saying this. A week ago, when you put your arms around me, it was him you were loving. Now you say it's me. Forget for a moment that you and he look exactly alike. You look alike, but you are different. It is perfectly possible to love two people at the same time for different reasons. It's only in storybooks that it is otherwise. So? How are we different, he and I? No, I shouldn't ask you that. There's no harm provided that I break no confidence. He's fierce, where you are gentle. Cruel, where you are kind. Selfish, where you are not. That's how I first knew. When I saw that you worried about other people. I didn't immediately know, it just seemed odd at the time. But something started in my mind, which during a week became the knowledge that this impossible thing had nonetheless happened. I wish I could accept it as easily. Precisely. I accept. I accept whatever happens, like I accept sun or rain. I accept your being here, like I accept food from the soil. So far, so good. But my mind staggers when I think ahead. Don't think ahead. Think as far ahead as it takes that bird to fly out of sight behind the trees. No more. No more. Just seeing that everything's all right for tomorrow. Uh, Care for a shot, sir? Uh, no, thank you. We're on our way to the foundry. Well, let's watch for a moment anyway. Do go on, Mr. Fournier. Ready? Ready. Pull. Well done. And your father's still the only man I've ever seen have three pheasants dead in the air at the same time. You remember, sir? Ready? Ready. Pull. Three pheasant dead in the air at the same time. And I've never handled a gun in my life. If I shoot tomorrow, the whole charade, campaign, call it what you will, is exposed and ruined. But if I injured my hand, I couldn't shoot, could I? How does that feel? Much less pain, thank you. Any chance of it being well enough for me to shoot tomorrow? Good heavens, no, not a chance in the world. Well, that's that then. Bad luck it should happen the day before the match. <laughs> Bad luck any day, of course. Yes, well, I'm very grateful to you. Uh, may I offer you a drink? Oh, thank you. Do you mind helping yourself? I'll have one too. <laughs> a very small one. The injection I've given you doesn't mix with alcohol. A small one, then. Oh, hello. What are you doing here? Oh, I thought in case you forgot to come and say good night to me, I'd come and say it to you. That was a very kind thought. How's your hand feeling? Oh, better, thank you. Dr. Allowan gave me an injection. I did this for you. Oh, thank you. Cedrak, Misak, Abdenago. In the burning, fiery furnace. Very comforting. I think you were very brave. No, I wasn't. It was automatic. You dropped something and then you snatched to pick it up without thinking. But you didn't do it without thinking. I saw the whole thing and I admire you very much for doing it. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, if you'd rather not talk about it. It's a very private thing, atonement. 
No, I want to have been inquisitive. I'll get you a drawing pin. Thank you. Mm. Good night. Good night. I just wanted to say I admire you very much. That's all. Excuse me, sir. Can I have a word with you? Yes, Gaston. I wonder if you'd have a look at the car, sir. I think there's some trouble with the gearbox. Excuse us. There was a telephone call, sir, from Villadeau. The lady said she must see you urgently. You'll have to drive me in. Yes, sir. I'll get back as soon as I can. Oh. Ah. What's, What's the matter? matter? You sent for me. I did not. I'm delighted to see you, but... Uh, Gaston said that he spoke to you on the telephone. You must have gone mad. Or psychic. I was thinking of you. A lot. I was thinking how much I would love to see you. And lo and behold, here you are. I don't understand it. Let's not waste time trying to understand it. Fate or the telephone operator has made a beautiful mistake and we are together when we might have been apart. I always knew you would grow, but somehow there were shreds of kindness mixed up with it. Healing marmalade, which I could pick out and nibble and pretend they were food enough to keep alive on. Now the only possible use I can be to you is to be dead. There's no point in keeping me alive, is there? Is there? Oh, please, please don't upset yourself. Oh, get out, get out. Get out and leave me to die. When that telephone call came, who was it you actually spoke to? The lady, sir. You're absolutely certain? Well, I took it to be the lady, sir. I see. Or rather, I don't see. Do you know whose car that is? Not Dr. Alwyn's, but that one. I think it's the police inspectors from Villado. What is it? Is something wrong? I'm afraid, sir. Jack, you must prepare yourself for a shock. A great shock. Marie Noel? No, it's not Marie Noel. It's Francoise. I'm sorry to have to tell you. She, she fell from her window. She was dead when we found her. When? How? About an hour ago. We had no idea of where to find you. Not that you could have done anything. I happened to be visiting your mother, and I was with her with... with Francoise, that is, in a matter of a minute, and nothing could have been done. Francoise? In the circumstances, I had to telephone the police. Inspector Rigo from Villado came at once. Permit me to offer my condolences, sir. Thank you. Where is she? She's... In there. Uh, uh, does the child know? I'm afraid it was the child who found her, though happily she didn't see her fall. Nobody saw her fall. Where is the child? 
She's in her room. Your sister Blanche is with her. I would ask you, uh, please, not to regard the proceedings as an inquest, but rather as an informal meeting to establish certain facts so that I need not trouble you again. Uh, for the purpose of recording her testimony, I shall attend in the bedroom of the Dowager Countess, who is, alas, bedridden. I am not bedridden. Furthermore, Even if I were, I would not consent to a troop of petty officials making a playground of my apartments. Steady. Oh, I can manage, I can manage if this, this cripple here will just stand on her feet. Well, young man, what do you wish to know? May I, on behalf of my colleague and myself, observe that the melancholy of this occasion is mitigated by the sight of you in better health? On behalf of the French Republic, if you wish. But I am in no way in better health. So get on with your questions. First, I would like to hear the testimony of the last person to see the deceased alive. Uh, from my preliminary information, uh, this was the little girl, her daughter. Your preliminary information is incorrect. I saw the deceased after the child did. As I was walking along the corridor toward my daughter-in-law's bedroom, the child came out, called good night, and went on upstairs toward her own room. So you need not trouble the child with your questions. Uh, that would have been about what time? I have no idea. I'm not in the habit of walking about my own house, making notes of what time I do things, as if I were boiling myself an egg. Uh, what was the subject matter of your talk with the deceased? Family matters. In what spirits did you judge her to be? In excellent spirits, better than I had seen her for some time. Oh, she had been in low spirits recently then. Most women tend to be in low spirits after a recent miscarriage. <clears throat> Quite. You saw no sign of depression? None whatever. Quite the reverse. Well, to sum up, you saw nothing to make you suppose that she might take her own life? An unthinkable supposition. I thank you. That was admirably clear. Just simple facts. It would need an idiot to make them anything but clear. Now, you, sir, were not in the house at the time of your wife's death. 
Uh, no, I was not. May I ask where you were? I was in Villado. He was not in Villado. He was in her room. I heard him talking there. Oh, uh, this is nonsense. I was in Villado. Did you see anybody there? Uh, talk to anybody who can confirm that? Oh, please, it's not that I doubt your word. Simply, we have a direct conflict of evidence. Somebody must be making a mistake. Uh, corroborative evidence would settle the matter. My business in Villado was of a confidential nature. In that case, perhaps I may ask you further about it in private. In public or in private, he will lie to you. He was in her room. He murdered her. Ask him about the terms of the marriage settlement. If you will wait until I ask for your testimony. I will not wait. If you please, sir, may I speak? I think I can help. Have you any objection? None. On the contrary. Very well, then. I drove my master into Villado. He couldn't drive himself because he'd injured his hand. I drove him into Villado, waited for him, and drove him back. And when we got back here, Madame was already dead. Your car was already here, sir, as we drove in. That is so, yes. They drove away. They drove back. What does that prove? What did he do in the interim? They're in league. He and his lackey. How much has he promised to pay you for your lies? I am a simple man, Miss Blanche. I have no education. I know how to drive a car and clean shoes. I do not know how to tell lies or take bribes. Simple, Jacques de Gay. A likeness, a chance in ten million, an astronomical figure gave you an alibi or a scapegoat. Nothing that you don't already know. It's horrible. It's melancholy. They wouldn't listen to me. They believed you and not me when you lied and told them that you weren't here. I'm not going into all that again. Well, I am. I'm going to go on until someone listens to me. I shall go to the police in Paris. I shall write to the newspapers. Or you can put me in an asylum if you like. But I'm going to go on writing and telling people. I shall tell them how I heard you talking in there. How I heard you singing that song. As you did when you came back from your honeymoon. I heard her laugh, and then I heard her scream. You say you heard someone singing that song? I heard you singing it. Hello? Who is that? A stranger. A comparative stranger, I suppose we should say. I thought you'd be surprised. Not entirely. Well, let's stop exchanging polite nothings. I would like to have a talk with you, and not on the telephone. When? Where? Where is the problem? Why not at the foundry? About 11 o'clock, say. Very well. At 11 o'clock.
in. There's nothing to be afraid of. Sit down. Well, this is nice. Let me have a look at you. You've put on a little weight, I think. All that good country food. And of course, you've changed the way you comb your hair. I thought we'd talk in here so much cleaner than Aristide's office. Pompous old idiot, don't you think? But a heart of gold. The trouble is, the gold comes out of my bank account. You haven't lost your voice by any chance. No, I have plenty to say. Oh, splendid. Well, let's have a drink first. I happen to know where Aristide keeps his brandy. Not for me, thank you. Truly, I seem to remember that you rather welcomed a glass of brandy. However, as you wish, you won't mind if I do. Well, now, tell me about your stewardship. Have you enjoyed it? I wouldn't say enjoy. It's been interesting. It's been most kind of you to assist. But now here I am to relieve you of the burden. I'm not anxious to be relieved. I wouldn't have thought my family possessed that much charm. In fact, to put it quite clearly, I refuse to be relieved. Of course, the situation has radically changed in the last few days. A large sum of money released as a result of my poor wife's death does possess a certain charm. I quite see that. The money is of no interest to me. You can't mean that you love my somewhat bizarre relations for themselves alone. I've come to know them, to like them to varying extents in their differing ways. I've seen their problems and have made attempts to help them deal with them. I would never have thought they could inspire missionary zeal. I assure you, warn you, I mean every word I say. Come now, Mr. Barrett, this is beginning beyond a joke and becoming an imposition. You've had three weeks of masquerade as a French nobleman, and now it is time for you to change back and return to your provincial university. And if I refuse, I shall have to compel you. Please don't be surprised. I'm not in the least surprised at a murderer being so equipped. Uh, do tell me, whose murder? Clause 14, paragraph 2. I don't think I need elaborate. But, um, just supposing I had murdered my wife, I would have a perfect alibi, because you were in Villado. Oh, Mr. Barrett, you really thought that you could live an elaborate lie in luxury for the rest of your life? The luxury I would dispose of elsewhere it would only be the lie that worried me. Sooner or later, they would have to be told. How? Uh, I don't know. Somehow. Otherwise, I couldn't bear it. A noble sentiment. No time to admire it now. It's time we changed into our own clothes. And our own selves. Good for you. That was a surprise, I must admit. But I've no doubt that I'm the better shot, even if you had the use of your right hand. At this range, even left-handed, even I could hardly miss. Oh, yes, you could. Surprisingly easy. I think you'd better give me that dangerous thing.
Villado. What are you doing here? Fate has made a beautiful mistake. And we are together when we might have been apart. Mm -hmm.